Good morning, or could be good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Dr. Philip Meese. I'm a rheumatologist from Seattle, Washington, in the United States, where it's quite early in the morning. Uh, and I want to welcome you to uh, the Grappa Spartan Global Education uh, Virtual Seminar Series. Uh, this is the uh, uh, last uh, seminar in our sequence focused on treatment of psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, and axial spondyloarthritis. Uh, this has been a collaboration uh, between the organization's GRAPA, which is a, a global organization devoted to education and research on psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, and Spartan, uh, which is a North American-centered organization devoted to education and research on spondyl arthritis, uh, especially the axial component. As mentioned, this will be a focus on uh, treatment approaches. Uh, and so each of the faculty will be going over the cutting edge aspects of uh, uh, new treatments, as well as building on the foundational aspects about what the, the goals of treatment are and uh, recommendations for treatment. Uh, we are also joined today uh, by uh, a patient research partner uh, from uh, GRAPA, uh, Martin DeWitt, uh, who has a extensive background uh, in uh, in supporting uh, the patient voice uh, in various uh, forum uh, around the world uh, and has contributed mightily uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to all of our efforts uh, and brings the unique perspective of having a person, of uh, being a person with significant psoriatic arthritis over, over the years. We uh, encourage you to ask questions throughout uh, and bring up questions which we will uh, address at various time points uh, during the uh, sequence uh, today. We will have uh, small breaks after each of the uh, presentations, uh, and then uh, uh, at the end, we'll have a longer time for uh, addressing questions. Here is our agenda, uh, and I'm joined by uh, Will Tillett uh, from Bath, uh, UK, uh, as well as Martin, uh, to discuss PSA, Laura Savage from Leeds, uh, uh, Dimantachi, unfortunately, could not uh, attend with us today, representing psoriasis, and Michael Ward uh, from the National Institutes of Health in the United States, uh, who is a researcher on axial spondyloarthritis. I want to very much uh, thank uh, Pfizer uh, for providing an unrestricted uh, educational grant uh, for this series. Uh, thank you, and I think we can uh, 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 go ahead. Oh, th uh, these are our faculty disclosures. Uh, let's go ahead and proceed. Thank you. Now we're starting uh, with a question, and we'll do uh, start each section with such a question, and would like you to redress these questions. So here we have a patient with active peripheral psoriatic arthritis and severe skin psoriasis. Their PASI score is more than 10, resistant to conventional synthetic DMARDs like methotrexate, requiring treatment uh, going to either a biologic or targeted synthetic disease modifying drug. So we are curious about which of uh, these, th these classes of treatments you would choose to go to at this juncture. So if you could make your choice. Okay, let's take a look. So it looks as though the majority of you would have chosen an IL-17 inhibitor at this juncture, I suspect partly because of the severity of the skin disease, and followed by a TNF inhibitor, then an IL-1223 inhibitor, and then the newest entrant to the approved drugs, uh, which would be a P19 IL-23 inhibitor. Okay. So now let's learn more about PSA. Hello. 
My name is William Tillett and together with Professor Philip Mees I'll be talking to you today about psoriatic arthritis, new therapies in development. I'll start by reviewing treatment paradigms and targets together with new data on conventional DMARDs, anti-TNF, IL-17 and 1223 before Professor Mees takes over and examines IL-23, targeted synthetic DMARDs and treatment recommendations. So what's new in psoriatic arthritis? We only had a couple of conventional synthetic disease modifying drugs at the turn of the millennium, and now we have a plethora of highly effective biologic and targeted synthetic drugs. First, I'd like to talk about treatment strategy, and this is the Tycopa study that you'll be well familiar with by now. Patients with early psoriatic arthritis were randomised to either standard care or a tight control arm, and in the tight control arm, treatment was escalated until minimal disease activity or MDA was achieved. And the primary endpoint was the proportion of patients achieving ACR uh, 20. And you'll see here that in the gray bars, the people who were in the tight control arm had higher rates of achieving ACR 20, ACR 50, and indeed ACR 70. So this study showed us that tight control and escalation of treatment until MDA was achieved improved outcomes. The next study I'd like to talk about is the control study, which I think has some real useful messages for our clinical practice. This study examined people with early active psoriatic arthritis who'd not achieved remission on methotrexate monotherapy. The first phase of the study examined the difference between dose escalation of methotrexate versus the addition of adalimumab. And the second phase of the study examined either the addition of adalimumab or the intensification to weekly adalimumab in non-responders. This is the uh, results from part one. And if I could draw your attention to the figure on the left, you'll see here 42% of patients who had adalimumab added achieved uh, minimal disease activity at week 16 versus only a very small proportion, 13% in the methotrexate dose escalation arm. The figure on the right shows that trajectory of response, which I always find helpful. This is part two, and I'd like to focus here on the adalimumab non-responders. 63 uh, of these patients were then uh, escalated to weekly adalimumab dosing and 30% of them achieved MDA by week 32, providing us some evidence that increasing the frequency of adalimumab injections can be a benefit to our patients with psoriatic arthritis. The next study that I think is useful to our clinical practice is the SEAM PSA study. And this examined patients with early psoriatic arthritis uh, and randomized to either methotrexate, etanercept, or etanercept and methotrexate. I'm using the MDA here uh, for consistency across the studies, uh, but this was a key ranked secondary endpoint. You'll see that 36% of patients in the etanercept arms achieved minimal disease activity at week 24 versus only 23% in the methotrexate arm. What I think is interesting in this study is that methotrexate doesn't appear to add any additional efficacy benefit uh, to the etanercept uh, arm. So if the scene PSA study told us that the addition of methotrexate isn't required for effectiveness, is it required for persistence with therapy? This study suggests that there may be a role for that in a combined registry of five European cohorts, showing that in all but one database, the addition of a conventional DMARD improved drug survival. By example, in the Bath cohort, the median survival on monotherapy alone was 3.2 years versus 6.1 in the group who had a conventional synthetic DMARD co-prescribed. So we've now started to get head-to-head -head studies in psoriatic arthritis, which is very exciting. And this is the uh, uh, SPIRIT head-to-head -head study. This examined adalimumab versus ixekizumab, and the primary endpoint was the simultaneous achievement of ACR50 and PASU100. And you'll see here that IL-17 uh, was statistically more likely to achieve this uh, endpoints than adalimumab, sustained out to week 52. We've also had uh, trials looking at axial psoriatic arthritis, and this is data from the Maximize trial examining secukinumab 300 and 150 milligrams versus placebo. The key endpoint here uh, is the AC, uh, ASAS 20, and the two figures you're looking at on the right hand side are uh, ASAS 20 and ASAS 40, and you'll see superiority versus placebo in both the secukinumab doses. We also have barmicizumab, a monoclonal antibody that selectively neutralizes IL-17A and IL-17F, uh, 
This is results from a phase 2b dose ranging study uh, and you'll see we are examining um, 16 milligrams of bimekizumab, 160, 160 plus a loading dose and 320. And here in figures B, C and D, you're looking at the ACR20, ACR50 and ACR70 responses, showing promising results and I look forward to the phase 3 data. Moving on from IL-17, I'd like to talk a little bit about IL-1223, and here we're looking at the Eclipsis study, which was a pragmatic open-label randomised controlled trial, examining the difference in skin, joint and enthesitis responses to these two mechanisms of action. You'll see here that the tender and swollen joint counts in figures D and E showed similar responses between ustekinumab and anti-TNF. Uh, but superior responses in the ustekinumab arm when it came to a, the PASI response in figure F and the enthesitis uh, outcomes in figures A and B. So any conversation around efficacy also has to consider safety uh, and as part of the 2019 updated ULAR guidelines uh, a further um, literature review on the safety signals uh, was undertaken and I'm pleased to say that there were no new safety signals in terms of anti-TNF and conventional DMARDs as res with respect to infections, cardiovascular events, malignancies, infusion reactions or, or multiple sclerosis. There are a couple of additional interesting uh, analyses that I'd like to draw your attention to. Uh, from the Artis and Dan Bayer registries there was no noted increased cancer risk from a large UK uh, database, there was an interesting analysis looking at cardiovascular events. And whilst rates were higher in patients with psoriatic arthritis not on DMARDs, patients on DMARDs with psoriatic arthritis didn't appear to show a higher rate of cardiovascular events, building the story that well-controlled inflammation probably improves cardiovascular outcome. The Spirit Head to Head study, which I've already shown you, also gives us an opportunity to examine the safety in a randomised control trial setting between anti-TNF and IL-17. Here you're looking at treatment emergent adverse events and you'll see very similar numeric uh, and percentage rates of treatment emergent adverse events. There are no deaths in either arm of the Spirit Head to Head study. In terms of uh, adverse events of special interest, you'll see similar levels of infections, um, uh, a, a slightly higher rate of uh, inflammatory bowel disease in the uh, ixekizumab arm as might be expected. To summarise, I've reviewed the treat to target strategy in psoriatic arthritis using MDA as the target. We've re reviewed the use of conventional DMARDs, uh, particularly with data from the SEEN PSA and control trials. And then we've looked at the rel relative efficacy of IL-17 and anti-TNF for skin, joint and axial disease. I'd like to hand over now to Professor Philip Mies. Thank you, Dr. Tillett. I am Philip Mies from Seattle, Washington. These are my disclosures. I'll be covering further classes of PSA therapeutics. First, IL-1223 inhibition with ustekinumab targeting the P40 subunit of IL-12 and 23, thus inhibiting both cytokines. Here are data from the SUMMIT-1 trial, phase three, showing ACR20, 50, and 70 responses with the light blue being the customary dose of 45 milligrams. Here is data on enthesitis improvement with this drug. Moving on to the IL-23 inhibitor class, this, these are newer. Guzelcomab uh, attaches to the P19 subunit of IL-23 and thus is very specific for that cytokine. Here we're seeing significant improvement in ACR20 response at 24 weeks, as well as improvement in the SHARP score in the every four-week dose arm, but not in the every eight-week dose arm. Also, uh, improvement of dactylitis and enthesitis. Skin response is very high, as shown here with PASI 100 and slightly less than 50% of patients. One area of focus with this class of medicine has been the effect on the spine. There was a failed trial with another P19 IL-23 inhibitor risen kizumab uh, 
in a small trial in ankylosing spondylitis and also a failed trial with ustekinumab. And thus there were uh, some theories about why this might occur immunobiologically, even though IL-23 is considered upstream from IL-17, which does work in the spine. To test the, whether or not ax, axial PSA might be enough different from axial SPA, in the phase three guzelcomab program, the investigators identified patients who they thought had axial PSA, and furthermore, had imaging confirmed sacroiliitis. These are the characteristics of the population showing elevated VASTI scores at baseline, and about 25% uh, were HLA-B27 positive, consistent with an AXPSA population. These are the results showing symptomatic improvement, including in the question number two, spinal pain. Also, some higher threshold improvements of the ASDAS score, such as inactive disease. Thus, we might consider whether there are enough differences between axial PSA and axial SPA to warrant thinking that IL-23 might work in PSA spondylitis patients. To further test this, uh, there will be a study of guzelcomab specifically in AXPSA patients, including in an MRI confirmation of spondylitis uh, at baseline and along the way. Here is data on rizinkizumab, uh, which uh, is being presented uh, in phase three at the upcoming ULAR meeting, showing improvements uh, in arthritis and skin responses, as well as inhibition of structural damage progression. And here's data with tildrakizumab showing again improvement of arthritis and not shown here, but very good results in the skin and other measures. So this is a promising class. Uh, overall, there is very low risk for serious infection and we haven't seen a signal for opportunistic infection, malignancy, MACE, thromboembolism or inflammatory bowel disease. Moving on to the oral medications. Uh, these uh, work uh, by uh, decreasing intracellular signaling uh, of, uh, by pro-inflammatory cytokines on an immune cell in purple in the middle, uh, showing uh, PDE4 inhibition, uh, resulting uh, in increased cyclic AMP and not as much conversion to AMP, uh, thus decreasing pro-inflammatory status of a cell and on the right, the JAK signaling pathway. Here is data uh, with a Primalast ACR 2050 and 70 responses in dark blue, a modest effect. Here is data on emphysitis and dactylitis showing improvement and skin effect, which again is modest 40.9 PASI 75. This drug is particularly good for patients with modest disease. Uh, and patients who are safety conscious. There is no signal for serious infection, malignancy, or adverse, major adverse cardiovascular events, and no laboratory monitoring, for example, of liver tests is needed. There are tolerability issues during the initial period of use, such as nausea, diarrhea, and headache, and there's an advisement about depression and weight loss. The Janus uh, kinase family of um, inhibitors uh, uh, will target uh, JAK1, 2, 3, or TIC2, uh, and uh, these various pairs sit at the uh, re cellular receptor for a variety of potentially pro-inflammatory cytokines and uh, inhibit uh, their activation of cells. In red are depicted the cytokines that are directly inhibited by JAK inhibitors, and in blue, those that are indirectly inhibited, including IL-17 and TNF. Here is data from the Opal Broad study of tofacidinib uh, and uh, the five milligram twice a day dose uh, is approved. It's in the light teal. Uh, and also this uh, showed improvement in function uh, and uh, uh, skin response. Here's data with filgotinib, a more selective JAK1 inhibitor showing improvement uh, again in arthritis psoriasis, enthesitis, 
and about a quarter of patients achieving minimal disease activity. Here is data uh, with upadacitinib, again, a fairly selective JAK1 inhibitor predominantly, uh, and showing very good ACR responses, skin responses, resolution of enthesitis and dactylitis in a bio-naive population. Note that the 15 milligram dose is what will be approved in psoriatic arthritis come July, uh, and it's in the um, uh, lighter green color. Uh, here we're seeing data on achievement of minimal disease activity in about a third of patients, improvement of function, uh, and inhibition of structural damage progression. A newer drug, Ducravacitinib, is very specific uh, for TIC2. And we're seeing here uh, good ACR uh, responses. And this drug also has very good uh, results uh, in uh, skin response as shown in the lower left of this um, slide, uh, as well as improvement of function and thesitis and achievement of minimal disease activity. The JAK family in general carries risk of serious infection, herpes zoster, and lymphoma, and one needs to monitor LFTs, CBC, and lipids. It's not clear if the above will apply to the TIC2 specific agents. And a recent trial oral surveillance in a large number of patients with rheumatoid arthritis who had high cardiovascular risk was studied and showed increased thromboembolism in the 10 milligram BID dose. So we avoid that dose. It's not approved anyway in psoriatic arthritis. And there was a slight increased risk for MACE and malignancy compared to comparator. This latter data has not yet been fully published, but it is present uh, as an advisement. Treatment recommendations uh, come from several groups. Uh, the GRAPA group uh, last published uh, at the beginning of 2016. Uh, Laura Coates will be presenting an update uh, uh, this ULAR uh, and hopefully soon a pub the publication, uh, which will update and include some of the newer medications that we've been referring to. Uh, this focuses on uh, the different clinical domains and the efficacy of various drugs. So for example, with peripheral arthritis, uh, it's certainly legitimate to use CSD mards, uh, as well as biologics in the uh, early stages. Uh, for axial disease, where there isn't evidence for CSD mard effectiveness, we would start with non-steroidals and then go right to a biologic and so on. The GRAPA group also focused on comorbidities as contextual factors for choice of medications. For example, if a patient has obesity and fatty liver, uh, then one might uh, be cautious about use of methotrexate uh, in, in case there is added hepatotoxicity. The ACR National Psoriasis Foundation uh, uh, came out with the novel suggestion of using a TNF inhibitor first before methotrexate based on efficacy and safety, uh, followed by uh, other agents such as IL-17 inhibitors, IL-1223, and JAK inhibitors. The most recent have been the update of the ULAR recommendations, uh, and they uh, recommend use of a CSD MART initially, but then moving on rather quickly if the patient is not having adequate response uh, to a bio biologic, including TNF, inhibitor IL-17, IL-1223. The P19 IL-23s were not yet available in terms of evidence uh, for their consideration. There's slightly different uh, recommendations for oligoarticular patients. And then for enthesitis and uh, axial disease, recommendation to go right on to a first-line biologic. And then, of course, depending on the patient response and patient preference, to then uh, considering switching to various other medications that are now approved. All right, now we are ready for post question number uh, one, uh, second chance uh, to have a comment ab about your response. So here we have a patient with active peripheral psoriatic arthritis and severe skin psoriasis resistant to CSD mards. So we're curious 
which class of biological or targeted synthetic DMARD agents would you turn to next? Okay, uh, it looks as though the responses are very similar. A few more would turn to an IL-17 inhibitor than answered previously, and then a, um, a, then a smaller percentage TNF inhibitors or IL-1223 inhibitors. It looks as though I think probably many in the audience have not had an uh, opportunity yet to work with the newest class of IL-23 inhibitors. Okay, uh, and then Will Tillett's um, uh, choice at this juncture would have been an IL-17 inhibitor. Look, well, let's open up to um, a, a brief panel discussion, uh, including uh, Dr. Tillett and Martin DeWitt. And uh, then we also and will address questions that are in the chat. But I'd like to first turn to Martin, uh, if, uh, uh, if, uh, if you would, wouldn't mind, Martin, the way that you just saw our presentations, we as physicians speak to each other in in the form of bar graphs and linear graphs, and that's how we how we talk. Uh, and I'm curious when uh, something about your experience as a patient, having uh, even back if you could think back to when you first were. Uh, developing psoriatic arthritis and some of the uh, thoughts and feelings you had about the way treatment options were being presented to you and how things have evolved along the way for you. Martin, uh, you're uh, muted, so if we can... There you go. I hope you can hear me now. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But... Okay. Okay. Um... Yeah, I, I, I thank for the opportunity to um, to ha have a say here, and I, I clearly clearly remember forty years ago when I was diagnosed when I was a, a teenager. I, I really got to know all the frustrations of creams and ointments, and th that was really really suffering, and it didn't help any much with, with the joints, to be honest, and, and it resulted in the need for a total. Uh, knee replacement um, with really walking limitations afterwards. Um, but then I think in 2001, when I had the opportunity to start with TNF alpha, that really, th that, that brought a difference between day and night for me. And, and it really started a new life. And from that day on, I actually feel that I'm a kind of Sunday child. Um, because I'm still now using anti-TNF uh, in combination with methotrexate, as, as we have seen, that, that that is working best. And for now, already 20 years. So I, I'm very grateful for what the developments um, have brought me. Um, and I think it's great. There are still questions um, that needs to be answered. And I still see a lot of other patients who, who, who are less lucky than I am, um, who still, whose disease is still not under control. But it's good to see that, that we are all on, on, on the right way and so many trials are going on. Thank, thank you very much, Martin. I, 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 I'm appreciative of your voice speaking for uh, patients around the world. We have a, ch a question in the chat, and I'm going to turn to uh, Will for a uh, comment on it. Um, I don't, it's from Lars Werner, and it's, it's, could you comment on the use of the different treatment classes with regard to gender, age, and ethnicity, maybe based on real-world data studies? Thank you in advance. So, Will, do you want to take a first crack at this? <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Philip. It's an interesting question because it it, it, it speaks to what we all want, which is a, a better way of selecting treatments for our patients so we can get the, the right drug to the right patient at, at the right time and at the right dose. 
There's no data that I'm aware of specifically around uh, which uh, mode of action we should be selecting above another based on gender, age and ethnicity. But each of these things can impact other typically comorbidities that will affect treatment choice. So, for instance, in the elderly with higher rates of infection, my, you know, my, my preference is to those modes of action that are less associated with uh, high infection risk. And you spoke about IL-23, uh, IL-1223, PD-4 inhibition. Um, different ethnicities have different um, predilections for different infections. And, you know, you might want to think about uh, zoster and the modes of action that have higher rates of zoster, perhaps being a little bit more cautious. Um, gender um, body mass index, I think, has, has a role here. And, and we're all aware that high BMI uh, impacts the likelihood of response, uh, duration of benefit. Uh, and there's some interesting data that's coming out at, um, in ULA. Um, uh, um, if we're in ULA looking at the fact that this may be a bigger um, a burden amongst women with psoriatic arthritis. So that, that might affect you know, uh, your treatment choice. You might go for a drug that has a dose banding option, such as the 90 milligram rastikinumab that you, you spoke about earlier. So that would be my view. Um, and I don't know if you've got any additional thoughts or, or data yourself that you'd like to speak to. I think that the uh, uh, post hoc analysis of the EXCEED trial that we saw at the ACR meeting was interesting and in that uh, this was a head to head trial between secukinumab and adalimumab. And in that uh, study, it was shown uh, that males had a higher rate of response to both medications. There was some slight difference between secukinumab and adalimumab in this regard, but really I think the key take home message was uh, that there might, uh, that females might have slightly less response. And there could be a variety of reasons for this. Uh, uh, immun immunobiology, uh, for example, we, and we've seen some very interesting data in this regard uh, in uh, AXPA. Uh, and then also uh, the potential for some degree of central sensitization in females uh, that may impact it. I'm not as aware of ethnicity differentiations. Uh, and it could be that there, they exist, but we just haven't studied them well enough, or, or there haven't been enough uh, patients of different, uh, many of the, of the studies that we've seen are primarily Caucasian, uh, many patients from Eastern and Western Europe, North America. Uh, so we, we may uh, not see quite as much from some of the other, uh, uh, from other ethnicities to really help us in that regard. But I think it's, these are important things for us to be studying. And a shout out uh, to gathering data from real world red registries. I'm very involved in the, uh, uh, what's called the Corona, uh, registry in the United States where we are um, looking at uh, rheumatoid arthritis, axial spa, PSA, psoriasis, and so on. And, and, and many countries in, in Europe uh, have uh, registries, which I think are important to give us real world information about our drugs and uh, treatments and natural history of disease. So I, I, in deference to time, I'm going to ask us to uh, move on, if we can, to uh, Laura Savage uh, speaking about psoriasis. with active severe psoriasis, nail disease, and possible Achilles enthesitis, who's resistant uh, to CS, uh, these uh, conventional medications such as methotrexate uh, and needs to be escalated into one of these classes of therapy, which would you choose? Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so it, it looks as though, again, the majority are choosing an IL-17A inhibitor here, 
I'm, I'm guessing that that's partly related to the severity of the psoriasis. And this is followed by an IL-1223 inhibitor, which we also know is very effective in the psoriasis component. Uh, and then a lesser percentage spread out uh, between uh, TNF inhibitor, IL-17 receptor antagonist, which would be bredalumab and is not as has not been quite as available as the IL-17A inhibitors. And then the, uh, a, a, a reasonable proportion choosing an IL-23P19. So we're gonna learn all about these uh, from Laura. So please proceed. Hello, I'm Dr. Laura Savage. And today I'll be talking to you about treatments for psoriasis, including new therapies in development. The therapeutic paradigms for psoriasis are constantly changing as a result of the development of novel oral small molecules and biologic therapies, although despite recent advances, the basic principles of a stepwise approach to management remain unchanged. All patients will, at some stage, have used and continue to need to use topical medicaments, and then those with widespread or recalcitrant disease will then need to progress to secondary care for phototherapy, systemic immunosuppressive therapy, or biologic therapy, depending on the disease phenotype. Topical treatments have remained unchanged for decades, and patients often rely on a combination of treatments to reduce both the cell turnover and inflammation that characterise psoriatic plaques. There are several well-characterised barriers to the success of topical therapy, being that patients are often not prescribed enough or advised as to the quantities required, and they may struggle to apply the treatment to inaccessible or hair-bearing areas, and many dislike the preparations that they're prescribed. So considering patient preference and cosmetic acceptability can contribute significantly to compliance. And care must be taken when treating the flexural or genital regions due to the greater vulnerability to steroid atrophy, and calcineurin inhibitors have offered an effective alternative to topical corticosteroids with a more favourable side effect profile. Scalp disease can cause significant psychosocial morbidity for patients and the addition of agents such as salicylic acid and coconut oil to soften and lift scale should be offered alongside corticosteroids and coal tar to reduce inflammation. Again, considering the preferences of each individual patient in formulation choice and the provision of clear instructions for use is paramount. And there's a continued need for more effective and better tolerated agents with novel mechanisms of action to both improve patient outcomes and adherence. However, the topical management of psoriatic skin is challenging due to the heterogeneity of skin lesions, with some areas being thickened whilst others having a markedly thinned epidermis, and this results in variability in drug permeation and systemic absorption. And drug concentrations may also be reduced due to pre-systemic meta metabolism of the drug on the skin. <clears throat> so liposomes, microemulsions, solid lipid nanoparticles, uh, nanostructured lipid carriers and my cells have the potential to encapsulate antipsoriatic drugs for topical application and remain in the research spotlight alongside techniques such as iontophoresis and lasers to enhance the penetration of the stratum corneum. The majority of investigational topical agents for psoriasis now target the small molecules that modulate pro-inflammatory cytokines and inhibit intracellular signaling pathways, such as phosphodiesterase 4, integrin, Janus kinase, and tyrosine kinase. At the recent uh, American Academy of Dermatology VMX meeting last month, data was presented for reflumilast 0.3% foam, a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, in addition to uh, tapinarov 1% cream, which modulates RL hydrocarbon receptors, and the results appeared promising. Nail psoriasis remains problematic to manage outside the context of biologic therapy, with limited success from topical and procedural therapies. Most phase three clinical trials only report nail outcomes as secondary endpoint measures, but until recently, there have been no real means of comparing efficacy. Christian Reich and colleagues have taken steps to address this in a recent network meta-analysis of biologic therapies in nail psoriasis, and have convincingly identified those medications targeting interleukin-17 as more effective in achieving complete resolution of nail disease than those targeting IL-23 or TNF. Little too has changed in terms of phototherapy. As a consequence of the pandemic, there has been an upsurge in the use of home phototherapy units, as patients have been kept out of offices and hospitals, 
There have been a few studies to assess the efficacy and the cost effectiveness, um, such as the Pluto study, which confirmed that it was comparable on both counts to that given in office. Now, there have been no new additions to our non-biologic uh, armamentarium since the introduction of a premolast in 2014 and dimethyl fumarate in 2018. Fumarates have been popular in Germany for many years and traditionally used in the form of fumaric acid esters until one of the methyl esters was licensed under the name of Skillerans. Efficacy was initially assessed in the BRIDGE trial against placebo and fumaric acid esters and PASI 75 rates were reported at around 40% for both active drugs. The Primalast targets phosphodiesterase 4 and was evaluated in patients with moderate to severe psoriasis in the ESTEEM 1 and 2 trials. PASI 75 responses in ESTEEM 2 at week 16 were low at 28.8% and as such Amgen have subsequently gone on to evaluate Primalast as a potential therapeutic option for patients with mild to moderate disease. And as reported in the advanced clinical trial at the recent AAD meeting, it achieved its primary endpoint of a statistically significant improvement in static physicians' global assessment response at week 16 compared to placebo at 21.6% versus 4.1% respectively. The adverse events in the trial were consistent in the known safety profile of a premolast, including diarrhoea in 14%, headache in 13% and nausea in 13%. And at the AED, we also heard for the first time the phase three data for Ducrovacitinib, the first oral selective TIC2 inhibitor, which forms part of the JAK-STAT pathway. So the POETIC PSO1 and POETIC PSO2 trials, which evaluated Ducrovacitinib 6 mg once daily against a Primalast 30 mg once daily and also placebo, met both co-primary endpoints versus placebo with significantly more patients achieving PASI 75 and a static physician's global assessment score of 0 or 1 after 16 weeks of treatment. At week 16, 58.7% and 53.6% of patients receiving ducrofacitinib achieved PASI 75, respectively, versus 12.7% and 9.4% receiving placebo, and 35.1% and 40.2% receiving primalast. And amongst patients who achieved PASI 75 response at week 24 with ducrofacitinib and continued treatment, 82.5% and 81.4% respectively maintained PASI 75 response at week 52. So moving on now to think about the biologic therapies. Well, we now have 11 licensed originator biologics for psoriasis plus biosimilars broadly spread across five main mechanisms of action. And while there are more treatments to come, it seems that we really have found the sweet spot in psoriasis in targeting the TH17 axis. Aside from ducrovacitinib, there are no new cytokine or intracellular targets, and indeed the two pipeline therapies in phase 3 trials were for mirakizumab, an IL-23P19 inhibitor, and bimakizumab, which targets the A and F isoforms of IL-17. So the astute amongst you may have noticed that mirakizumab is in grey on my slide. And that's because, despite demonstrating high efficacy in published phase 2 trials, as shown here, and outperforming secukinumab in phase 3 trials, Lily last month decided not to enter into the crowded um, IL-23P19 space for psoriasis, and instead are going to focus on IBD. For children, our options are more limited, although we now have five biologics with a paediatric indication, the latest being secukinumab, which is approved for children aged 6 and above. Now, compared to our counterparts in rheumatology, we are in a relatively advantageous position as we have many more active comparator or head-to-head -head clinical trials between different biologics, which can really help enhance our understanding of the differences in treatment efficacy and tolerability. In recent years, novel therapies have moved away from comparisons with TNF inhibitors such as Atanacept, and we now have head-to-head -head uh, comparisons between some of the most efficacious drugs on the market. Now, the first of uh, such trials was the Eclipse trial, comparing the efficacy of gaselkimab to secukinumab. The time to achieve PASI-90 was faster for secukinumab, but over 48 weeks, gaselkimab had a higher PASI-90 response at 84.5%, compared to secukinumab at 70%. Another IL-23P19 inhibitor, Rizankizumab, also went head-to-head -head against secukinumab as part of their extensive Phase three trial programme. 
and again we can see that out to week 52, Rizinkizumab was superior to, at achieving PARSI 90 at 87% compared to Secukinumab at 57%. And then a third and final IL-17, IL-23 trial is IXORA-R, comparing Ixikizumab to Gisalkimab, but this time with a PARSI 100 primary endpoint at 12 weeks. So unsurprisingly, Ixikizumab was superior, although the discrepancy reduced by week 24 when the study ended. And it would have been more meaningful, I think, to see the responses out to at least one year, given the chronicity of psoriasis. So the comparative efficacy of biologics in psoriasis has been compared in several network meta-analyses, but one of the most recent, and therefore up to date, was presented by April Armstrong and colleagues at last month's AAD Congress. A targeted literature review was conducted to identify the most recent phase two, three and four randomised controlled trials for FDA and EMA licensed treatments for moderate to severe psoriasis that were available before the 1st of July 2020. PARSI 75, 90 and 100 response rates at the end of the primary response period, which was between 10 and 16 weeks from baseline, and the maintenance period, which was between 48 and 52 weeks from baseline, were estimated using Bayesian statistics. And in the short term, across 69 randomised controlled trials, the PASI 90 rates were highest for Ixikizumab, Rizankizumab and Bradalimab, each at 72%, which was significantly higher than the remaining uh, biologics and or small molecules, which are presented here as the number needed to treat relative to placebo. In the longer term, across 11 randomised controlled trials, the PASI 90 rate was highest for Rizankizumab at 85%, which was significantly higher than Bradalimab, Gaselkimab, Ixikizumab, Secukinumab, Ustakinumab, Adalimumab and Atanacept. As mentioned earlier, the newest biologic agent that is preparing to come to market shortly is Bimakizumab, an IL-17 inhibitor, which is the first to target both the A and F isoform of IL-17. The drug has been investigated in four placebo-controlled phase 3 randomised controlled trials, three of which had an active comparator arm. In Be Ready, as shown here, patients were randomised 4 to 1 to bimakizumab 320 mg every four weeks or placebo. And at week 16, patients in the bimakizumab arm who had achieved a PARSI 90 or greater response from baseline were re randomised 1 to 1 to 1 to receive bimakizumab 320 mg every four weeks, bimakizumab 320 mg every eight weeks, or placebo out to week 56. Patients in the initial placebo arm or those in the bimakizumab arm who did not achieve PARSI 90 received bimakizumab 320 milligrams four weekly out to week 56. And then patients uh, were then subsequently enrolled into an open label extension study called Be Bright, which is yet to be uh, to report. So the co-primary endpoint of superiority of bimakizumab 320 milligrams administered every four weeks over placebo was achieved with 90.8% of patients achieving PARSI 90 and 92.6% achieving an IgA of 0 or 1 at week 16. And no new safety signals were identified across the entire phase 3 programme, although looking at the adverse um, event of special interest, we can see rates of fungal infections were high at over 11% in the initial period to week 16 and over 20% at the end of week 56. And there were no instances of inflammatory bowel disease or adjudicated suicidal ideation or behaviour amongst patients treated with bimakizumab in Be Ready. Bimakizumab has also been investigated in a head-to-head -head study against ustekinumab, whereby 81.6% of bimakizumab treated patients achieved PARSI 90 at week 52, compared to 55.8% of patients achieving ustekinumab at licensed dose. And again, rates of fungal infections were higher at 14% for bimakizumab compared to just 0.6% for ustekinumab in the initial trial period out to 16 weeks, and 23.3% versus 2.5% for bimakizumab and ustekinumab respectively in the maintenance period out to one year. There were also uh, more major adverse cardiovascular events in the bimakizumab group, although these occurred in patients with two or more pre-existing cardiovascular risk factors, which may have contributed to the events. In the Be Sure Phase 3 randomised control trial, uh, bimakizumab was investigated against adalimumab this time, and patients were randomised one to one to one to receive subcutaneous bimakizumab 320 mg every four weeks for 56 weeks, bimakizumab at a dose of 320 mg every four weeks for 16 weeks, then every eight weeks 
uh, from weeks 16 to 56, or subcutaneous adalimumab at a dose of 40 mg every two weeks for 24 weeks, followed by bimekizumab at a dose of 320 mg every four weeks to week 56. And the co-primary endpoints were PASI 90 and an IGA score of 0 or 1 at week 16. And at week 16, 86.2% of bimekizumab treated patients in both dose groups uh, combined achieved PASI 90 compared to 47.2% of adalimumab treated patients. And in those who crossed over from adalimumab to bimekizumab at week 24, the same high response rates were observed as those who'd received bimekizumab from baseline. And as in the other trials, the most common adverse events with bimekizumab were upper respiratory tract infections, hypertension, diarrhoea and oral candidiasis, which was seen as a rate at a rate of um, 16% in b -Sure. And then finally, presented at the AAD last month was B-Radiant, the phase 3B trial against secukinumab. So patients were randomised one-to-one -to, -one to receive either bimekinumab, 320 mg every four weeks, or secukinumab, 300 mg weekly to week four, followed by every four weeks to week 48. And at week 16, patients receiving bimekinumab underwent re-randomisation in a one-to-two ratio to receive maintenance dosing every four weeks or every eight weeks to week 48. And the primary endpoint in this trial was PASI 100 at week 16. At week 16, bimekinumab was shown to be non-inferior and superior to secukinumab. 61.7% of bimekinumab patients and 48.9% of secukinumab patients achieved PASI 100. And then at week 48, 67% of patients treated with bimekinumab had a PASI 100 response as compared to 46.2% of those treated with secukinumab. And again, oral candidiasis occurred more often with bimekizumab at 19.3% compared to secukinumab at just 3%. A further recent network meta-analysis published in a German journal has also included bimekizumab alongside other biologic therapies for moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. And while the error bars are large, bimekizumab appears to be as efficacious compared to placebo as ixikizumab and more so than infliximab, rizankizumab and gesalkumab. However, compared to placebo, the forest plot for tolerability suggests that bimekizumab has some of the greatest rates of adverse events, which in the most part is likely to be due to the high rates of candidiasis seen in clinical trials. So network meta-analyses such as these tend to focus on short-term endpoints and we tend to look to registries for a longer-term real-world assessment and comparison of biologic therapies in psoriasis. However, I just want to finish off with these interesting data in press by Loft et al, which report how early response to treatment with biologics might be important for the stability of psoriasis and long-term outcomes. The aim of the study was to assess whether risk of flares and drug survival are associated with disease activity in the first six months of treatment um, of psoriasis with biologics. Bio-naive individuals enrolled into the DERM bioregistry were grouped based on absolute PASI during the first six months of treatment as PASI equaling zero, PASI zero to two, PASI two to four, and then PASI greater than four. And we can see how the probability of flare-free survival was greater in those with the lowest absolute PASI scores after six months of treatment. And so from these real world data, it does seem that a low PASI in the first six months of treatment with biologics in bio-naive patients with psoriasis may be associated with a more stable disease course, lower risk of flares and longer drug survival. So that concludes our review of the therapeutic armamentarium for psoriasis. To summarise, we have reviewed the current stepwise approach to the management of psoriasis and considered some of the innovative approaches under investigation for the development of new topical treatments. We've heard clinical trial data presented at the recent AAD Congress for Ducrovacitinib, a novel oral TIC2 inhibitor, for a primalast in patients with mild to moderate psoriasis, and for bimekizumab, the new IL-17A and F monoclonal antibody, which has demonstrated superiority against adalimumab, ustekinumab, and secukinumab in head-to-head -head trials. And then finally, we've taken a look at some of the more recent network meta-analyses and registry data, which permit meaningful comparisons between therapies in terms of efficacy, tolerability, and drug survival. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.
Uh, and, uh, Laura, and, and I'd like to uh, first, before we open to panel discussion, uh, take a look again at uh, question number two in this uh, patient with severe psoriasis and what seems like early uh, a PSA who has is needing to move on uh, to either a biologic or a targeted synthetic DMARD. Uh, if you all could take a choice here of which class you would choose at this point. Okay, let's see how the responses are. It looks like about two thirds of you would choose an IL-17A inhibitor, and then a smaller percentage, uh, one of the other agents here, uh, uh, spread spread amongst them, TNF inhibitor, IL-1223, IL-17 receptor antagonist, one of the new uh, P19 inhibitors, uh, uh, or JAK inhibitor. Okay, uh, thank you. And it looks as though, yeah, that's fine. So uh, why don't we now turn back to the panel and I'd like to uh, uh, first, if it, uh, we can bring up Martin, I wanted to ask you a question about, uh, here, here we have a, a not, an interesting situation where we have more than one specialist group attending uh, to patients with psori psoriatic arthritis. And so inevitably, you're going to have biases in the office by the, the rheumatologist focusing more on musculoskeletal aspects, unless it's a really holistic uh, uh, rheumatologist who's quite knowledgeable about the skin disease. Uh, and there are not that many of us that are, are that holistic, including me. Uh, and the uh, and then you've got the dermatologist who uh, is knowledgeable about uh, musculoskeletal disease, but really focused on the skin. Uh, and I'm curious if either along the way for you, Martin, you were just observing uh, some of those uh, distinctions between the specialists you were visiting, uh, or and any that, anything that you've heard from others in that regard. Yeah, I think this is um, this is really a problem for patients, um, and, and it is something that I really pay attention to. Uh, and I've seen this also uh, within my children. I have three children who all three has been diagnosed with psoriasis, um, and I think it makes a difference that they know that they have a father with uh, psoriatic arthritis, so they are very keen to monitor their their joints, and if they have complaints, and they do sometimes, that they very quickly look the support for a rheumatologist. But I think there is there is um, many patients who do not have that awareness, and that if they have psoriasis, they attend to their dermatologist, um, not considering seeing another specialist, so it, there is a lot of um, under recognition of the value of looking for others' uh, expertise, specifically from a rheumatologist, um, and the lack of education of patients. Um, so I, I think we should do a better job in there to prepare patients, uh, even if they don't have complaints in their joints, th that they should be alert alerted to that. And how about for you, uh, has, uh, have there been times when the skin disease has been uh, more significant and uh, unaddressed or uh, uh, can you comment on that? Or is, that, is the skin disease not quite as severe for you? Um, well, there have, been, there have been periods, yeah. But, but to be honest, normally I see, I saw my rheumatologist um, who was not so alert for the skin, didn't ask for that. Um, so there is some reluctance to bring that up in, in your consultation with your rheumatologist. So I think it, it has been, there have been periods that it is undertreated and only 
in the times that it, it really became severe, I have asked to see a dermatologist. Um, but looking back, I think I should have done that more often. So that's a shout out for patients' empowerment to take some of this into their own hands and, and direct uh, the, or guide their physicians. Yeah, I think absolutely. Yeah. And there's a role for patient organizations, but also for physicians um, to, 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 to contribute to that, to make patients more assertive uh, and more responsibility, uh, responsible for their own treatment. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We have a few questions in the chat, which we I think we can at least uh, handle one or two. Um, here's one that I think is maybe easier. Uh, that Saikumar Dunga asked, what is the reason for IL-23 inhibitor having more efficacy after 52 weeks in head-to-head -head with IL-17? And I guess the sort of converse is the in interesting finding that you have sort of like the um, uh, rabbit and the tortoise story where you have the IL-17 working more quickly in the early part. Do you, do you have any comment about that, Laura? Yeah, absolutely. So when you block IL-17, you're obviously getting immediate neutralization of, you know, the key effector inflammatory cytokine that's driving that whole inflammatory response. With IL-23 blockade, you're trying to block the downstream production of IL-17. So by neutralizing IL-23, you're trying to prevent the maintenance of those pathogenic TH17 cells. And so it takes a little while longer for those skin resident memory T cells to be cleared once that driving cytokine has been neutralized. Um, and, I, you know, so that's why we see the rapidity for the IL-17s. It's not that much more rapid, though, when you look at the studies like Eclipse or the Emerge study between the two IL-23s and then and, and Sekikinumab, you're looking at about 10 to 14 days different to achieve POSI-90. So again, you have to sort of ask how clinically meaningful that is because what we do know with IL-23 inhibitors, it is the, 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 the action is, is linked to that durability of response. So I, I liken it, I'm very simple the way I think about things, I liken it to a carton of milk. If you have a carton of milk and you knock it over, you spill the milk and with your IL-17, you're mopping up that milk, but you've still got that carton of milk and you can still spill it again. With your 23 inhibitors, you're actively removing that carton of milk, so you cannot spill it. So I think that's why you're seeing that durability of response. Spoken like a mother of toddlers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's, a, there's another question here from Lars Werner, um, which I, can't even begin to address, but I ho hopefully you can, Laura. Do you want to, uh, can you read the question and then? Uh, uh... Let me see, which, uh, is this the one about the IPC? Yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So if people are not familiar with that, I would encourage them, and, and, and Lars has very kindly put the, the link to the, the, the IPC um, sort of new classification that's been proposed by the uh, IPC about severity of, of psoriasis. And to me, this is really important because it's enabling our patients to access more efficacious and tolerable treatments much earlier. So the IPC have proposed that um, the, the patients are, become candidates for systemic therapy in the traditional way. So once psoriatic lesions affect 10% or more of the body surface, but also for psoriasis lesions on sensitive areas of the body. So the hands, the feet, face, gentle scalp, or if topical th therapy have failed to control symptoms. And I think this is something that really excites me because my biggest frustration in clinic is for patients who have high impact site disease but they do not achieve a PARSI 10 um, and so we are stuck going around in the circle of cyclosporine and methotrexate. We, in, the, in the UK the, the, the prescription of biologics is really tightly governed um, and, and patients have to meet that target of PARSI 10 um, and it's incredibly difficult for these patients who really are profoundly psychologically affected by disease at high impact sites that they're not able to access what we know are efficacious therapies and it's daft because it's about economics at the end of the day but yet biosimilar adalibimab which we know will be highly effective is actually cheaper than branded cyclosporin so and without the side effects without the same monitoring without the same frequency of attendance so it's it's a very silly system so i i fully support what the ipc are trying to do here because i really think that their definition reflects the true severity of disease and it's not just about having 
the right type of plaques in the right place. It's about thinking about the patient as a whole and their psychosocial uh, mo 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 mobility as well. Thank you. Uh, and by the way, IPC stands for International Psoriasis Council, uh, which is a, a, a global organization devoted to uh, psoriasis. The uh, uh, I, I have been hearing from my uh, UK rheumatology colleagues about some of the restrictiveness that that is existing there. And uh, for, we in the U US, we don't have quite as much restrictiveness. No. So uh, I think that um, uh, this is a, a good advancement. I think what we'll do uh, for sake of time, uh, 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 if Ping, if we could just say, uh, we'll save your question for the general chat uh, at the end. And uh, if we could go on to uh, hearing from uh, Michael Ward about Oh, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting these questions. So Michael has submitted this question prior to his talk uh, on axial spa. So this patient who has no comorbidities but active disease in their spine despite non-steroidal treatment in whom you are considering escalating therapy, which class of medication uh, would you choose next? And what he's done here is given you some individual choices, but also uh, uh, equally combined, for example, TNF or IL-17 inhibitor, or any of the three, including a JAK inhibitor. So please choose. Okay, so it looks as though the majority would choose either a TNF or an IL-17 inhibitor equally likely. And we're gonna hear some of, uh, comments from the treatment recommendations uh, in this regard from Michael. And then uh, secondly, a TNF inhibitor. So please proceed. Hello, thanks for joining us. Uh, my topic uh, uh, for today is uh, an update on the treatment of axial spondylosis. Arthritis. The topics we'll cover are medications for signs and symptoms. Uh, we'll review the ACR treatment recommendations and uh, go over how these contrast with the most recent ASAS ULAR treatment recommendations, and then finish up with a few thoughts on disease modification in axial SPA. As far as the medications uh, for signs and symptoms are concerned, uh, these are the categories of drugs that are currently uh, used, NSAIDs, of course, being the mainstays of therapy. Sulfasalazine, methotrexate, and corticosteroids really restricted to fairly specific special indications, primarily uh, to treat patients with peripheral arthritis. And then, of course, uh, moving on to biologics, TNF inhibitors and IL-17 inhibitors, and uh, now more recently uh, under investigation and becoming available, uh, JAK inhibitors. Um, one question that has been uh, often asked is whether any particular NSAID is more effective at pain control uh, than any other NSAID in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. In years past, we had always thought that uh, indomethacin might have some special effectiveness. Um, this is the result of a meta-analysis of short-term placebo-controlled trials of NSAIDs, with the outcome being change in uh, uh, mean pain scores over two to eight week period of time. Uh, and in this network meta-analysis, we can see that etorococcib actually is the NSAID that has uh, the greatest uh, pain, improvement in pain uh, relative to all of the other NSAIDs tested. Um, etorococcib not available in the U.S., but uh, in many locations uh, uh, it is available, and from my understanding, it does have some uh, preferential use among rheumatologists for uh, treating axial SPA. Uh, of the other commonly used NSAIDs, naproxen, meloxicam, diclofenac, silicoxib, uh, all of similar effectiveness. Uh, so from that regard, uh, unless you have a torcoxib available to you, uh, there's no evidence to support preferential use uh, 
of one NSAID over another. Um, in clinical trials, uh, and oftentimes now in clinical practice, uh, uh, we use the patient-reported outcome of the BOF AS disease activity index, which is a patient-reported measure of severity of these six symptoms, a zero to 10 scale, fatigue, spinal or hip pain, peripheral uh, joint pain or swelling, tenderness to touch, which tries to assess enthesitis, uh, and then morning stiffness, severity, and duration. Um, as far as uh, the question of whether any particular TNF inhibitor is more effective than any other, this is, a, again, another network meta-analysis of controlled clinical trials of the eff efficacy of TNF on change in the BASDI. So again, a zero is where the placebo response is, and you can see that relative to placebo, all of the N all, excuse me, all of the TNF inhibitors uh, have uh, comparable efficacy, uh, maybe a little bit a greater a relative improvement for infliximab or biosimilar infliximab on the bottom there, and that may relate to um, its uh, IV mode of administration, perhaps giving a more prompt uh, onset of action. Um, in phase three trials of TNF inhibitors, uh, the ASUS-20 response is uh, the most commonly used primary outcome, and that involves a 20% or more improvement in three of four measures, along with an absolute improvement by one out of 10 in those three measures, and no worsening in the fourth measure. And the measures are all, again, patient-reported outcomes, patient global assessment, spine pain, morning stiffness, and physical functioning. If we look at uh, the uh, phase three controlled clinical trials of, of uh, TNF inhibitors, you can see that their ACES-20 responses all uh, hover around 60%. Uh, compared to placebo responses, which were in the 20 to 30 percent range. Um, if we consider what characteristics of patients may make them more likely to respond to TNF inhibition, um, this is the results of a meta-analysis of 33 studies, including trials and observational studies that found that men, those with a higher BOSDI, those with an elevated CRP, and those who were HLA-B27 positive were more likely to respond to a TNF inhibitor, whereas older patients and those who had a higher functional impairment were somewhat less likely to have a good response. So something to keep in mind when you're thinking about um, uh, trying to assess likelihood of response uh, to treatment initiation in your patients. Um, what about patients with non-radiographic axial SPA? Uh, this is a very nice meta-analysis of, again, controlled clinical trials uh, that looked at change in, in BOSDI in non-radiographic uh, axial SPA patients and in, in patients with radiographic axial SPA. And you can see here improvement in BOSDI uh, standardized mean difference of 0.73 in the non-radiographic group, standardized mean difference of 1.0 in the radiographic group. So while there is improvement um, with TNF inhibition, there may be slightly uh, less improvement in the non-radiographic group than in the radiographic group. Um, what about IL-17 inhibitors? a familiar sort of pattern of results from uh, clinical trials. Uh, you see the secukinumab results here in blue, the ixokizumab results in green, and again, active treatment arms uh, had uh, approximately 60% response uh, to on the ACES-20 measure with placebo responses anywhere from 30 to 40%. Um, interestingly, uh, uh, in the ixakizumab trial, they uh, separately enrolled and examined outcomes in TNF non-responders, uh, 
and also demonstrated improvement in that subgroup of patients. ACE has 40 responses, uh, averaging about 40%, and placebo responses about 20% uh, in these short-term clinical trials. Um, and JAK inhibitors, again, very similar sort of graphs. Um, uh, active treatment groups uh, with about a 60% ACEs20 response, placebo responses here may be a bit higher than the uh, earlier trials, up to 40%, um, and comparable across uh, tofacitinib, upatacitinib, and filgotinib. Um, so again, short-term clinical trial responses for all of these classes of drugs, TNF inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors, JAK inhibitors, with ACEs20 responses in the 60% uh, uh, ballpark. Um, those uh, clinical responses on patient-reported outcomes uh, with uh, uh, upadacitinib have been uh, sort of substantiated by uh, comparable large changes in imaging uh, uh, measures of inflammation, both MRI uh, in the spine and MRI of the sacroiliac joint, um, much greater improvement in um, radiographic measures of inflammation in the active treatment arms than in the placebo groups. If we look at ACR20, excuse me, if we look at ACR um, treatment res response, Treatment recommendations, uh, NSAIDs and physical therapy are the standards for new uh, uh, initial treatment of uh, patients with active disease. Um, uh, sulfasalazine and local glucocorticoids for patients with peripheral predominant disease that remains active despite NSAID treatment. Uh, and uh, sulfasalazine was preferred over methotrexate. If disease remains active despite NSAIDs, the treatment recommendation is TNF inhibitors over IL-17 inhibitors or tofacitinib. Um, there's no preferred N uh, TNF inhibitor, uh, with the exception of patients with recurrent uveitis or concomitant inflammatory bowel disease when TNF monoclonal antibodies are recommended. If people have uh, uh, active disease despite a uh, trial of TNF inhibitor. The recommendation for the next course of, uh, of treatment uh, depends on whether they were a primary non-responder to the TNF inhibitor. In that case, an IL-17 inhibitor would be recommended, um, or if they were a secondary non-responder, meaning they had some response for some period of time that was then lost. Uh, in that situation, the recommendation would be to first try an alternative TNF inhibitor, uh, uh, thinking that uh, they might have a, a response to an alternative agent in that class before switching classes of drug. Um, as far as treatment of stable disease, the focus was really on how long do you continue treatment. Um, if patients were on a biologic, the treatment was really against discontinuation of the biologic based on evidence that more likely than not, uh, the disease would recur. Um, and against tapering, although tapering could be considered uh, along with the shared decision-making with the patient if there was particular concern about the amount of medication that they were using. If the patient was treated with a biologic in addition to NSAIDs or a conventional DMARD, the recommendation was to stop the NSAIDs or the conventional DMARD first and continue with the biologic. As far as uh, contrasting the ACR recommendations with the asus ular recommendations, uh, there are several differences. To, uh, when starting biologics according to the asus ular treatment recommendations, uh, they really recommend only doing so in the cases where there's an elevated CRP or a positive MRI or the patient has radi radiographic disease, uh, uh, as well as failure of courses of two NSAIDs, and high disease activity with uh, some patient-reported measure or the OSDAS and the rheumatologist opinion. They also recommend a reassessment of treatment response at 12 weeks, 
and recommend continuing the biologic only if the OSDOS has decreased by 1.1 or the BOSDA has improved by 2 out of 10 points. If there's failure of the first biologic, they recommend either a TNF inhibitor or an IL-17 inhibitor uh, with no distinction uh, between those two based on whether the person was a primary or secondary non-responder. And they en endorse a philosophy, at least, of treat to target, uh, although they don't really recommend any specific target. Uh, to finish up, we'll talk a little bit about disease modification. Uh, and this is based on changes in uh, uh, spine radiographs measured by the MSAS, uh, which looks at uh, development of uh, erosion, sclerosis, squaring, or syndesmophytes in the anterior corner of the spine, cervical and lumbar, a possible range of 0 to 72, uh, scored on uh, 12 uh, vertebrae, and an increase of one point per year in this measure is taken to indicate progression. Uh, there are three studies that compared active treatment with etanercept uh, to historical controls, uh, and none of those uh, pay, none of those studies demonstrated uh, a lower um, mean change in MSAS over two years than historical controls, uh, which are quite disappointing when these uh, results initially came out. Subsequently, uh, there was a study of celecoxib, which showed that patients who use celecoxib on a daily basis had less radiographic, uh, less radiographic change than patients who used it only on, a, on an as-needed basis. Uh, but this was not similarly confirmed in a, in a study of diclofenac. Um, and the question was, uh, is this not, uh, telling us that there's a COX-2 selective uh, effect on uh, uh, proliferative spinal disease in patients with axial uh, SPA? Uh, the jury on that is still out. Um, if we look at prospective cohort studies of TNF inhibitors as potential disease modifiers and look at, um, again, change in MSAS over a two-year period of time, the pooled result of these particular uh, series of studies suggests that there may be some suggestion of an improvement with less radiographic progression in people who used TNF inhibitors over those who were not treated with TNF inhibitors. Um, the problem with many of these studies, again, there's a very long latency of effect. Uh, so starting a TNF inhibitor, you may not expect to see a change in your x-ray over two years, and that may require much longer duration studies. The MSAS itself is not terribly sensitive to change. Um, it's driven by syndesmophyte formation, and new syndesmophytes are rare to detect over a two-year period of time. And there's also the question of confounding by indication. Obviously, people who are treated with TNF inhibitors may have more active disease, uh, and therefore may be those particularly prone uh, to new syndesmophyte formations, chlorosis and squaring. And so differentiating that disease activity from the treatment effect can be uh, very difficult to do in observational studies. So, th so there's tentative suggestion that TNF inhibitors may be disease modifying, but I would say the jury is still out. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And let's turn now to post question three for the same patient who has axial spa no comorbidities, but active disease despite NSAID treatment, which a treatment would you select next? So if you could answer. Okay, so it looks as though the majority would choose either a TNF or IL-17 inhibitor, equally likely. A TN and the second choice is TNF inhibitor, and then the third choice is any of the uh, three equally likely. Okay. 
uh, including now the JAK inhibitors, which are going to be entering uh, the armamentarium shortly uh, with, uh, uh, with upcoming, at least in the United States, approval for uh, for both tof tofacitinib and upadacitinib. It looks as though Michael has chosen a TNF inhibitor next. I think this suggests that there is some gradual evolution of our of the uh, attendees thinking about the efficacy of some of the other mechanisms beyond TNF inhibitor class. So um, before we, um, I, I went to, there's a, a question, uh, there's some questions in the chat. But I would like to engage um, our panel. Uh, and uh, I'd like to start with Martin again, if you don't mind, Martin. And uh, let us know whether you have, you yourself have had manifestations of spine disease, whether that was, how that was verified or, or stumbled upon. Uh, because back pain is so ubiquitous in, in humans that a lot of times I have patients that that will have active PSA and peripheral joints, but and they have some back pain and they just assume that it's related to their some de degree of degenerative arthritis, and uh, and therefore it's sort of a separate issue. Uh, and I know that this can be sometimes frustrating if if it's hard to you know you can't, it's not you can't look at the skin you, as you can in the skin, or you look at a swollen joint, the spine is more different, more obscure to evaluate. Can, can you offer any comments, Martin? Yeah, personally, I, I, I don't think I have any symptoms of um, uh, spine involvement. Um, I, I do have had periods with, in which I experienced uh, back pain, but I've never consulted a rheumatologist about that, um, assuming that it is separate. And over time, it disappears, and sometimes it comes back. So I, I, I always thought it, there's no need to also to to also uh, discuss this with my rheumatologist. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that but that's the truth. Um, it, again, I think it has to do that it, it's, it, it's often not asked. So I'm not asked about do you have uh, back pain? And I think it, it, it is also a matter of education. Again, it is this meeting now that, that and other meetings, of course, that makes me aware that I should be more careful about that. Um, but, but I assume that for a majority of patients, they are also not aware that back pain can be a connected symptoms to psoriasis or to, or to psoriatic arthritis, uh, or even a disease on its, its, its own. Well, this is fascinating to hear. Okay. So I, I would like to get uh, Michael and Will to have a uh, some back and forth on two issues. One is that will you presented some data from the maximize trial uh, and we saw both improvement clinically in the BASTI scores for example and the asdas scores in that trial uh, in dedicated to axial psoriatic arthritis with secukinumab uh, 60 percent of the patients in that trial had evidence of mri activity in our abnormal mri activity suggesting inflammation but 40% did not. And so we, we have this exercise between GRAP and ASAS coming up, which we're, in which we're gonna to try to come up with a classification criteria for axial PSA. And, and a challenge we're going to have is how to take into account these patients that have normal appearing MRI scans. And I want Michael to, if you don't mind, comment from your pr perspective on whether you think this data with the interleukin-23 inhibitor, with the whole controversy between its failed trials with ustekinumab and uh, rizinkizumab, but then this provocative data from the DISCOVER program with guzelkumab in, axia, in the uh, PSA patients. And were they truly looking at axial manifestations when they saw improvement, or was it just the uh, 
spilling over of improvement in other aspects of the disease that was being measured. So go at it. Will, first, you want to first comment on how to tackle this group of negative MRI patients? Uh, so, Philip, I, I think this is incredibly difficult, and I'm sure in asking the question, you know that there isn't going to be a super easy answer to it. Um, I think that last point you were making around um, spillover of response and, and getting a general improvement uh, in those, particularly in those patient-centred outcomes as somebody feels better in all the ways that we know these highly effective biologically targeted synthetic molecules work. But equally, as a practicing clinician, I feel that there's more than one um, phenotype of axial disease in psoriatic arthritis. And there are people who have negative MRI scans who get better clinically. You know, I think, you know, um, in the same way that we've had patients with fibromyalgia that are miraculously cured by their enthesitis improving. So I really welcome this, this initiative. I don't have a great answer to your question, though. I'd be really interested in Michael's thoughts. Mm -hmm. You Michael, you're, you're, you're muted. Now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I think it is an incredibly difficult problem in part because I think um, our, our ways of detecting inflammatory back pain or diagnosing inflammatory back pain are limited by... Uh, the imprecision of language. I mean, we just don't have specific enough words for patients to use to communicate the, the symptom that we as the clinicians interpret as being inflammatory back pain. So I think there's quite a range of variability in, in the descriptions that patient, you, patients use to describe their back pain that we either interpret as being inflammatory in nature or non-inflammatory in nature. And there's a wide overlap between those descriptors. Mm -hmm. And conversely, um, there's the question of how sensitive the MRIs are at detecting mm -hmm. levels of spinal inflammation that may not match the level of symptom in the spine that patients can feel. Um, so we have limited sensitivity and specificity on both, um, both ends of the, of the diagnostic uh, spectrum. So you're trying to relate these two um, and the purest group would be people who have clear-cut inflammatory MRIs and clear-cut um, checks all the boxes uh, inflammatory back pain and who then get better with your therapy. <laughs> that, right. group, that group then you know. Um, yes. But all of the other uh, variabilities in that Venn diagram, I think, present their own unique challenges. Yes, thank you. Um, the, uh, uh, there is a uh, question in the uh, uh, chat box, uh, Laura, for you, uh, which is the um, uh, question from uh, Ping Sung Ong, which is, do you think that the higher uh, amount of candida seen with bimikizumab uh, is related to the specifically to the additional uh, feature of blocking IL-17F, which may, on the on the silver lining side of that, is that that may give you greater efficacy, uh, mm -hmm. but then there is this uh, uh, collateral effect. So, do, can you make a comment? Yeah, I think at the moment it's not clear if it is the F isoform of IL-17. Um, you know, perhaps that isoform is more fundamental, um, you know, to the protective role that IL-17 plays against uh, fungal and candidal infections, um, you know, or is it just that the high rates of candidiasis are representative of the more profound blockade of IL-17 overall? But then, you know, you could counter that with the fact that we use bradalumab um, as a receptor antagonist, so we don't tend to see the same rates of candidiasis. I mean, we should mention, shouldn't we, Philip, that the rates were higher, but often they were mild. And of course, yes. it's the population that's been scrutinized in clinical trials. And, you know, one wonders whether this is something that we will then see in our clinical practice and, and, and be enough for patients to want to discontinue treatment. 
that we have had a few patients on ixekizumab where you know it's been really problematic and we've stopped but not perhaps as much as i think we were anticipating from the data i think time will tell with with bamikizumab whether it's the same so i don't think we can fully answer that at the moment but it, it, it would seem logical you you've been slightly more potent you're blocking two isoforms therefore you get more downstream effects because of that pivotal role that 17 plays in regulating antifungal immunity so we we'll, we will see thank you very much we can go on and on uh, <laughs> uh, uh, with lots of questions i do want to bring up uh, we we have a participant uh, one of the attendees is uh, one of our patient research partners from grappa arnon katz from israel and he stress he, he adds to Martin's comments that the issue of the back pain is very important, but likely not addressed frequently enough or by many clinicians, even uh, even experienced rheumatologists. So I I do think uh, this is uh, an I, I think has been fantastic to have uh, everyone's different perspectives uh, represented today. Uh, I want to, uh, we, we do need to bring this to a close. I want to thank very much our uh, uh, presenters, uh, Laura, uh, Martin, Will, and Michael for these uh, great contributions to uh, learning uh, from your various perspectives. I think bringing this, uh, the, this different disciplinary perspectives is very important. I would also like uh, to thank the, uh, the attendees uh, for taking time out of their schedule to, to learn more about psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, and uh, axial spondyloarthritis. I'd like to thank our production team from Nucleus based in the UK, which has been really pretty flawless in, in producing all of the different educational modules. These educational modules will be available uh, in an enduring format, so you could come back and uh, learn all over again, uh, uh, or bring uh, uh, colleagues uh, to learn uh, from the uh, Grappa and Spartan websites, respectively. I'd li like to thank Lisa Spiegel and Janine Koak, uh, administrative assistants from, uh, from the uh, Spartan and Grappa groups. Uh, and I'd like to especially thank Pfizer for su supplying us with a unrestricted grant uh, for conducting these educational se seminars. It's important to us that you complete the survey uh, that the, uh, to summarize your thoughts about you know, what you've been seeing and learning and uh, both critical as well as appreciative comments would be greatly appreciated. We will be having, uh, we anticipate uh, in the fall uh, that we will be having more uh, uh, educational seminars going forward because this has been so successful uh, and uh, including uh, a some special focus uh, in the, some of the first ones on pediatric uh, aspects of disease. And so uh, we look forward to more in the future. Thank you very much uh, for attending.